collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. Coming up on the programme this week, are you taking the right medicine and who's checking? So what might be right for you, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, may not be appropriate for you anymore. Making the impossible possible is easier than you think. There are external circumstances that you cannot influence and why waste your energy trying to change things that you cannot change? Why don't we always look at what we can influence and control? A Danish project aims to build dementia-friendly villages in our cities. That's why we want to create a community, and an environment where everyone wants to live. Because things that are good for people with dementia are good for everyone. And why is this bell in the buffer zone in Nicosia? Alpana Mayer is head of prescribing and therapeutics for the Scottish Government and she's been coordinating a programme for governments on prescribing and therapeutics. It seems that an awful lot of people are taking far too many medicines or perhaps the wrong medicines and she's here to tell us about a project that plans to put a stop to that. So what did you actually do and why was it necessary? Okay, so it's important to say that sometimes um, what we know is that people start off on medicines that can be right medicines for them, but maybe as they have long-term conditions or as they get older, because their body changes, these medicines no longer suit them or they suffer from side effects from them. So what might be right for you, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, may not be appropriate for you anymore. Especially if I've been prescribed other ones in the meantime. Exactly. So it's about making sure that patients have a review so that they're on the right medicines for them so that they get the best outcomes from the medicines. So it's making sure that you bring a holistic review but the patient's at the centre of it and that as a patient that you have a role to play that you can ask the questions that you need to and have the information you need to help you make the decisions about the best medicines for you. And that's very important isn't it because sometimes medical professionals have perhaps a different priority from the patient. Yeah. It's How always... easy is it to understand if the patient does have a different priority? So the key question that we would say is ask the patient at the beginning what matters to them, what's important. So find out because 50% of patients that take four or more medicines don't actually take them as prescribed. So find out right at the beginning from the patient what's important to them and you can find out from them how they're going to take the medicines because if they have a discussion with you and don't take anything anyway, there's little point. Uh, you're not going to get it. Whereas if you work with the patient, you can get the best outcomes from your patient and your patient knows why they're taking the medicines that they're on. And you also save money, of course. You will save money, but that's not the aim. Uh, the aim is to improve the patient outcomes with the medicines. So what you want to do is to prevent inappropriate medicines that the patient doesn't need. So it's never about stopping medicines. Yes, you do stop, inevitably stop medicines because you find things that people don't need anymore or are causing them harm. But that, the aim is to improve the patient's benefits from the medicines that they take. And I think the project came up with a sort of, in a sense, like a committee approach that you ought to have three or four people who are interacting together to do this review because they're each coming from a slightly different angle. So how important is that? Well, it's really important to address it from a multidisciplinary response and having a pharmacist there as part of the team because actually there's lots of people that are taking lots of medicines and so it's, it's working as a team. So you don't need to all be in the room at the same time but as healthcare professionals we do need to talk to each other and have one record where it's documented what we're doing to the patient so that that as someone else comes along, they don't undo what the other person did. So it's about having a pharmacist, a GP or a geriatrician that will work in partnership to improve the outcomes for the patient. And I think the idea of the project was that it could be extrapolated across Europe or indeed even further abroad. 
How did you go about that? Because you had partners in the European Union. So we had um, 10 partners across the EU, across eight different countries, with different income levels and different healthcare systems. And what we did with the programme was develop key principles, find good tools that they could all use and access and to implement them uh, and make those freely available to everybody so that actually... By the time we finished the project, we learnt the key lessons from our partners, um, but we also did benchmarking that went right across Europe. And from those, we learnt lessons that then other countries across Europe can now tap into and benefit from the resources that are on the website. So they can literally go to the website, find the tools and apply them in their country? Exactly, yeah. They can download them from the website. There's a handbook that we've produced that's available on the website. And there's also some videos that have been done with patients, but also with uh, healthcare leaders as well. So we've got um, a leadership a professor from Harvard who's helped us with with some of the issues that countries might face when trying to implement change. And so there's lots of tools that can help guide people through that process. And the website is? It's www.sympathy. Dot EU and sympathy is S I M P A T H Y. Alpana Mayor, Sympathy Project Coordinator and Head of Effective Prescribing and Therapeutics at the Health and Social Care Directorate of the Scottish Government. And that website once again www.sympathy that's S I M P A T H Y dot EU. You can subscribe to the Cypress News Digest on iTunes for free and get the program downloaded to your phone or tablet so you can listen anytime, anywhere. I suppose if you think about the average lifestyle of most of us these days, it's pretty stressful. We rush hither and thither and we tend to let negative thoughts take over sometimes. Well, of course, it's not only unhealthy, but just... Not very nice to let that happen. So how can you be more positive? My next guest was in Cyprus recently talking about exactly that. How to make the impossible possible. It's the secret we'd all like to know. She is Esther Jacobs. She joins us now. So Esther, how first did you get into the speaking circuit? And I think you've written books as well about something that, let's be honest, probably affects 99% of the population. <laughs> True, it's very familiar and also it's very paralyzing and many people realize that. And I found a way to turn things around. Uh, you ask how I got into speaking. That's also basically how I uh, became like well known and how I um, made the first proof of my um, philosophy. Uh, when the euro was introduced in Holland in uh, 2002, I collected all the leftover foreign coins for charity. And I collected 16 million euro worth of uh, worthless coins um, and donated that to charity. And also, uh, it, when the euro was introduced, th there were a lot of negative thoughts. People thought everything is going to be worse and more expensive and security was an issue and everybody was worried, all the, the government, uh, the banks, everybody was worried about the negative things. And my collection proved to be something positive. People would give away something that had no value to them and we would help charities. And because this was the only positive thing at that time, I got a lot of attention in the media. So everybody knew about the collection, everybody donated their coins. And also I became like mini famous for, you know, the girl next door doing something unusual and finding something positive uh, or seeing an opportunity where other people only saw uh, like problems or, or uh, restrictions. So, so that's you, how it all started. And then after the success of that, how did you decide that maybe this was the way to go and that there was more to life and more you could offer people in perhaps turning inwards? Is that a little bit of something we should be doing, looking at how we approach things? Um, I think the most important thing is working with what you already have, looking what's already there instead of talking about or complaining what's not there. So what we usually do is we look at a situation and put energy into why it should have been different or why it shouldn't be this way, but it's not going anywhere. What I learned is any situation is a given. Um, there are external circumstances that you cannot influence and why waste your energy trying to change things that you cannot change? 
Why don't we always look at what we can influence and control? Focus on that and then you feel that you're in control and that's what makes the difference. Either you complain and try to change things that cannot be changed and you become frustrated and burned out and negative. Or you look at tiny things within this given circumstance that you can influence, you take control, and at least you have a feeling that you're in control of your life, your business, your project, whatever you're doing. Can you give us an example of sort of everyday life things like that? Um, well, for example, when I go somewhere and there's a line, a lot of people, you know, go stand in line and they wait. I always go to the front of the line to see what we are waiting for. And if there is another window, another time, another opportunity, maybe I don't need, you know, whatever is distributed at the window at that time. So I always uh, think independently. And for some people, that's really annoying. Like the people standing in line, there's another person going to the front, you know, asking what's happening. Um, but for me, it has a lot of advantages. I only stand in line when I know that it's useful and after I've checked the alternatives. And it's not just about standing in line, it's about doing anything. Filling out forms, going to places. Um, how many times don't you get instructions you have to do this and you, do, you have no idea why you're doing it? Within a company, you know, in, in relationships. So... Like I said, for some people, it might be annoying that I'm always asking questions that I'm always thinking, you know, why are we doing this? But many times it proves very useful. And I presume that if you're successful at it, as you obviously are, that it means your time is very much better spent. Yes. Yes and no. <laughs> uh, I'm, I can be very efficient. Um, but if I fill all of my time with being efficient, I get a burnout, you know, I, if you're only working all the time. So what I notice when we're trying to do time management or be more efficient, what we usually do, we spend the extra time or energy on more work. So in the end, we're still working all the time. And what I've learned, not because I'm so smart, but because I had a car accident and I had a whiplash and I didn't have a lot of energy so I had to be very careful how I spend my energy. Now I pick the, the moments where I have energy and I do things. And when I feel like nothing is happening, I don't try. I don't force myself and I take the time off. And I know a lot of people are struggling with productivity. And if you know that you're a morning person or an evening person or you feel now is the time I have energy or I feel like doing something, what if you could pick those productive hours during a day? Couldn't you get a lot more done than sitting in an office from nine to five or, you know, whenever you have the time reserved or somebody else tells you to do something? What would the difference be if we could all spend our productive hours being productive and the rest of the time getting inspiration or relaxing or doing what we like to do? It's something that I think a lot of big companies, and I'm thinking of Apple and Google in particular, have brought on board in their businesses which are huge businesses where they let you have a nap after lunch or you can go to the gym for 20 minutes or they've put running circuits around the top of their buildings, I think, one of them, so that you can actually switch off because they have discovered that productivity rises dramatically when you go back and sit at your desk. Exactly. And some, pe uh, some companies force employees to spend 10% of their time doing something completely different. Uh, I think it's 3M who started with that uh, because they found out people are more creative and new ideas come when you're taking a shower, when you're walking the dog, when you're playing cards and not when you're sitting behind a desk. Um, and also companies like Google and Facebook, they provide their employees with anything. Like you can get your laundry done, massages, sports, like you said, anything to um, keep people productive, but also to keep them in the company. Keep them happy. Well, but also to, to keep them productive. So I know people who work at Facebook and uh, they're hardly ever home because the, everything is uh, in the company. You have your social life, you have your dinners, there's cooks there, you do your sports there um, and you also work there. And uh, some of them even sold their houses and they bought a camper van and they're camping out on the parking lot, the Facebook parking lot, <laughs> because they just go home to sleep. So why? And then they have to be in traffic. So why not sleep in the Facebook parking lot? Go to work in the morning, have your shower, there, have your breakfast, do your sports, your social life, your dinners, your work, everything. And then at night, go back to your camper van to sleep. 
Wouldn't work if you were married, I suspect. No, but most of those people aren't. And after a few years, they, they also get a burnout. So again, um, doing different things and knowing your productivity hours is great. But don't try to be more efficient to fit more work in a day. Put more life into your hours uh, instead of just filling everything with work. We mentioned, I think, at the beginning that you've written books. Is this all laid out somewhere for people whose interests have been piqued by our chat to actually read what else you've got to say? Well, it's interesting that you ask because I wrote... I think about 22 books now, some I wrote myself, some I contributed, uh, but they're mostly about um, realizing your dreams, uh, you know, the big charity project I did, uh, location independent living. So they're mostly about almost like physical things. And this whole thought, thought process we've just been talking about of energy management is something that recently keeps coming up in, in talks. So this might be the next book that I'm writing. I even got a title already, um, How to Light Your Fire Without a Burnout. Because I know when you're passionate about something uh, that you want to keep going. And we are used to keep going, to, to use all our reserves. And if we take a break, if we do yoga or meditation or take a holiday, it's just to fill up our reserves and to go back to spending this energy. And the whole idea about living, I think, is to have enough energy to also do other things and also be effective at what you do at work, but not to always live on your reserves. And everybody drinks coffee and eats sweets and uses alcohol and drugs, some people, to keep this energy going, to keep this adrenaline going. But what would life be like if you could still be productive, but you could really feel your body, feel it when you're tired, take a nap when you're tired, spend quality time with friends, be with yourself, be happy with yourself. Um, it's, it's possible if we don't keep pushing ourselves so much. That, the same thing I've done for so long. Have you got a website? Yes, my website is estherjacobs.info. That's easy enough. Esther, E-S-T-H-E-R, jacobs.info. So there you are. You've got some clues as to how you can manage your life a little bit better and make some time for that all-important person, yourself. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambis. When I was in Denmark recently for the European Week of Health and Innovation, dementia was very much one of the topics being discussed. I met up with Dr. Esther Schappel and she explained what she did. I'm the chairman of uh, Margaritens Wenne, this is the Friends of Margaret. And that's a um, uh, dementia support organization that has focused on applied science. And our main topic is that we want to build places that are really fitting for people with dementia. So we, we want to create environments that are supporting people in their disease. Because dementia, you can look at it as a handicap. And when it is a handicap, some people need a wheelchair for the handicap and other people need glasses for their handicaps. And people with dementia need environments that they understand and that support them so that their cognitive impairments do not trouble them too much. And when you support people in the right way, then even people with dementia can have many very good years. So how do you go about doing this, particularly in the community? That's what's important, yeah. isn't it, is that these people are part of the community and it's a two-way street in terms of the advantages. Yes, and that's why we want to create a community and an, an environment where everyone wants to live because things that are good for people with dementia are good for everyone. The other way around is not true. There are many things that you and me can handle very well in daily life but are really something that is so chaotic and difficult for people with dementia, that they lock off and they disappear in their little uh, private uh, houses and they give up on life simply because it's too difficult. And uh, the way I grew up, I grew up as a child in a little village, 3,000 people, and people with dementia were at home in that village. They knew every street and every stone and they would sit under the big tree and they would look at the children uh, skipping ropes and playing soccer and they would be part of the community. They would know the shops, everyone would know them, and only if you would talk with them directly, you would notice that sometimes were a little bit funny. Cool. We want to create environments that are uh, wonderful for everyone, where 
old people can live with dementia, old people without dementia, young people, families, where everyone feels at home because it is a, it's a safe environment that, that you can overview. You understand where you are. Because a person with dementia does not have the memory to tell him that he is in a new and complicated place. Every time again, when he opens his eyes, when he looks around the corner, he has again to understand, where am I? And then the environment where he is has to explain itself. So you understand, oh, I'm on the marketplace now. This is where you buy your fish. Oh, I'm in the church. This is where you pray. Oh, I'm in the theater. This is where you're quiet and look at the scene. So the environment has to help people to decode where they are. And the environments, the modern environments, are so complicated that people with dementia cannot decode it anymore, and they give up. And when they give up, their dementia becomes quite fast worse. So are you talking about creating brand new communities, or are you talking about making adjustments to the communities that we already live in? Because the other thing that is well known, I think, about people Mm -hmm. suffering from dementia is that very often... It happens at an age when they start to need physical care as well. And if you move them into a nursing home or a new environment where they don't have the memory that they need to sustain their dementia, Mm -hmm. then it becomes very complicated. Exactly. And the problem is when you move a person to a nursery home who has advanced dementia, this is really something very difficult. In the village where I lived... The nursery home was in the middle of the village. So even people who could not live at home anymore, when they opened the door of the nursery home, they were still in the environment they knew. So we would like to give people the opportunity, those people who want, because we go very much for freedom, those people who want, we want to give the opportunity to come and live in our dementia-friendly areas where they can live many good years without dementia. And if their dementia one day becomes so serious that they need a lot more care, then all the care is around the corner, so they never really move. And they already have the memories, but that means you have to move people there because you suspect that they have early-stage dementia. There's another problem, isn't it? There is. how you determine whether or not these people might need this care a few years down the line. And now we get... There are two important things in what you're saying. The one is, we move people. No, we don't move. People move themselves. So... Anyone who would like to live in a dementia-friendly area can move there whenever he wants. It's his total free choice. You can't do this in an urban setting, can you? Oh, yes. We are an urban setting. We are going to make villages in the city. And this village that we are now building in Odense, we hope it's going to be the first of many. And it's going to be a place where we can try what works best and which of these aspects can we simply plant another place. Because... You can have many villages and cities and municipalities all around Denmark and all around Europe and the world uh, where there are parts of the cities where it's not so difficult to change them a little bit to make them much more human-friendly, can you say. And when it's human-friendly, it's also dementia-friendly. And then the people who live in this village can think, hey, we go to that part of town, because in that part of town, it will be much easier for us to grow old. All the shops are around, uh, we cannot get lost, We understand the environment, and people who would like it can move there. I'm interested to know whether you've spoken to town planning experts about this and why on earth it hasn't been done till now. (laughs) The first question, yes. (laughs) The second question is because our understanding of dementia has been really poor. I don't know if you've been to the lecture that was held by the Swedish lady about what's happening in Switzerland and Queen Sylvia. I mean, in Sweden and Queen Sylvia. She got a mother with dementia and started looking for the best possible care for her mother and found out how little knowledge there was. And then the Sylvia Institute in Sweden was established. And we, with our association, Margoriten, have the same problem. We notice there's so little knowledge, and the knowledge that is there is so fragmented, we have to put it together and we have to apply it. So we call it for we are an organization for applied science. And uh, town planners have simply not been aware of the possibilities. And we hope that in the future every town planner will know what he can do or she. Esther Schappel, who I met at the Week of Health and Innovation in Udense in Denmark a few weeks ago. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. (laughs) 
that is the sound of a bell that you will see if you wander into the buffer zone in Nicosia. It's opposite the Home for Cooperation. And it's the work of Marcus Verget, who joins us now. You do a lot of work now, I think, with bells, Marcus, but tell us about this particular one. I was um, invited by the Artist Foundation, who were aware of some work that I'd done putting bells in the sea and activating communities through that project and to come consider this uh, space and uh, because all my work is based in trying to empower the community and give a voice to people who don't always have a voice. You've worked, I think, in a lot of Eastern European countries, again, in a sense, conflict resolution. The ringing of the, a bell is an expression of power, and uh, what originally got me interested in bells was the fact that I just wanted to ring one myself, but you're not allowed to, the school bell, the church bell, and so I decided to make bells that were democratic and uh, allow that power to exist for all people. When so can I, anybody come and ring the bell? This, this bell is uh, for everybody to ring and for nobody to own. And what is so extraordinary about this uh, space here is that the voices that discuss the space mostly never are here. And so I thought by making a bell that could be rung by anybody, it would uh, give a voice to those people who use this space on a daily basis. And it's part of a project with the Artos Foundation called Does Europe Exist? which. I find it a little bit hard to get my head round, since we are part of Europe. What's the idea of that project, and where does the bell fit into it? The Artist Foundation set this project up to discuss our changing relationship within uh, Europe now. So many changes are happening within Europe at this precise moment. And so what does this mean? Are we a market? Are we a club? Are we an institution? Are we a concept? So it is really to promote a discussion on how do we see the future of this evolving organization. From my own position on this, uh, especially coming from the UK, I feel very strongly that the the European Union is a centre of uh, potentials and ambitions that uh, we may not like it all, but the ambition is something that we should all strive for, which is, if you have more than somebody else, you must share it. Well, there's an idea, and I should say that the bell is hung between some beautifully carved oak off Marcus's farm, and he said anybody can ring it. I'm going to do that right now. We'll go round and do one of each of those ringers. This edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.